proposal was uh, last year, two hours, yeah. in November. Um, I was supposed to land, you know, to arrive in Dansk for a microservice, Java user group event. And for unknown reasons, the plane arrived here. And um, I negotiated with a taxi driver, this was the craziest ride of my life. <laughs> Dance. And uh, it turned out that the taxi driver never left Poznan. So here, yeah, just uh, it's unbelievable. You know the highway to Dansk? So there is like automated ticket system, right? And the taxi driver thought there is someone inside and tried to communicate with the box. And I said, okay. So I, I have really no idea here, but I would just try, you know, go with money to the box and you would get a ticket back, yeah? Oh, it did work differently last time that we spent five minutes, you know, just to communicate it with the automated box. And there was no one inside. <laughs> So, um, now I'm back. On the first time, I was in 2008, and I was the speaker number four of the Java user group, Cos9. And I actually don't know why I was here. It was NetBeans Day something, and I have no time for the NetBeans Day. So I just say, I have no time, but I will come and develop something on stage. They say, okay, let's do this, and I did it. So, um, and now I'm back with a little bit more structure. So I started with Java 1995, and I still like it. And what I forgot to mention, please ask questions. I just saw that uh, you got lots of questions. Ask me the whole time. Otherwise, I'm in trouble. So I don't have the structure as you have. So I, I just uh, had the basic thoughts on the talk. And um, yeah, there are some emails. Um, this might be of interest. The first Monday of the month, I got the all questions which I get per email and try to answer them at once. So I don't answer the email questions anymore because it's, um, it's impossible. So I do it uh, live. And there are some workshops. Many people from Poland, actually, from Gdańsk. I post and I can remember. Gdańsk is always someone, uh, interestingly. And um, online course and books. And the first thing is adoption. So what my um, slides are about. So um, I had a problem. I had enemies everywhere, yeah, right? So um, if you think about this, Spring guys didn't like Java E, and I was one JP guy in Java E, and the Java E architects and developers didn't like my style of development. So they, they, they wanted to have, you know, several square meters of UML first, and then layers, transformers, code generators, and I, I didn't believe in this. So uh, the JP people didn't like me because of, uh, of not liking the UML and all the transformations, and the Spring guys don't like Java E as general strategy. So um, there's no, you cannot explain this. So and um, so uh, what I try to do is what I, I try to show what what, uh, what worked in my project and what happened this year actually. It started last year, end of last year. I got lots of feedback from projects. So many projects went to production and say this worked great. So okay, can you give me an interview? Someone I got an interview. Someone I didn't. But what I present to you now is this would work well. You can challenge me and ask me questions whatever you like, even microservices or I don't know, shitty Java E doesn't work, I don't care. I'm a freelancer, right? So um, whether Java E works or not, is um, I try to make it working, but uh, right now I really like it. So, but I have no business uh, relation with Oracle, Sun, Microsystems, or whatever. Okay? I was suspecting to work for Sun back then. It would be great, but I think it would never work for Sun. I was with freelancer since 1997. So adoption. So uh, what's, what really surprised me, the adoption of Java E and Java 8, at least, uh, I forgot to mention, I'm working in, um, in Germany, uh, Austria, Switzerland. I never had a project in Poland, so I have really no idea how it, how it looks like here. But um, um, in uh, Java E, it's, uh, it works surprisingly, but it would also change. Back then, at the early beginning of, of Enterprise Java, I heard a lot like Java is not suitable for small projects. It is only suitable for large projects. What I hear a lot right now is like uh, Java is perfect for small projects, it doesn't also work for large projects. It's like uh, flipped around. So I never heard this argumentation, and now it starts to happen. But also, um, 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 uh, I heard a lot, even a project in, in, in Krakow, they use Java for startups. And this really struck me as like, why? Why startups? I mean, startups usually use, I don't know, what I thought, closure, right? Yeah. Or something uh, different than Java. 
closure, scala, or whatever, just not to do what your father did, yeah? Something like this. And, um, and they told me, because we, we have a problem to solve, we would like to send something as fast as possible, and we really don't care whether you just know log4j 1.4 or 2.0, I don't care, download the API and just start hacking. And this was the consistent response from, uh, from projects like getting things done, we have one dependency, the Java 7 API, and we don't care. And um, what also happened, you probably know, um, Oracle dropped the commercial support for Glassfish last year, and many of my clients uh, decided to migrate to Whitefly, for instance, because of this, and they were surprised how, how well it worked. I was also surprised. So we, we usually schedule two weeks. It was usually faster than this. What also surprised me, that uh, many of them took Eclipse leak to Whitefly because of better error messages. So um, I always had the argumentation in Glassfish, you know, we would like to have Hibernate, and now they could have Hibernate, but wanted to have Eclipse but this is just a side story, it doesn't matter, but they took um, Eclipse link with, with, uh, with the project. I was always against about such a thing, because if you think about this, um, they will probably will never get support from for Red Hat for this, for this mixture, between, uh, uh, for Whitefly with, um, with uh, Eclipse link. So, Java 8. Also crazy, most of my projects are Java 8, a few projects are Java 7. Now, um, in Germany, they say, okay, you are also always talking about Java 7 and how it can be, and Java 8, and in our project, we use uh, no, JDK 1.3 and, and uh, Java Web Server 1 from 1997, right? And uh, what I always do is, I call it guerrilla tactics, it's like, do something now and ask for forgiveness later. So. Um, it was like a, a, a larger project, it was a, a, actually a bank, and they hired me for a new architecture, and I was supposed to use JDK 1.5 and WebSphere. So, okay, I mean, this is like, you know, I don't know whether you are aware of, it's called German Museum, it's like Munich, it's like, you know, you see the old airplanes, like, like for me it's German Museum technology, like the old JDK. What we did instead, we used uh, Docker, Java 8, new with Wi-Fi, uh, AngularJS and REST services, and the funny story is, um, I was actually supposed to help them at the beginning, this was a typical bank project, and I think I was in total like 15 days or, or something, after 10 days they didn't have any questions, they are productive right now, and for the last 5 days I built them a project, a stateful machine, state machine, uh, this is on my, uh, on my GitHub account, <coughs> because they needed it for something, I forgot for what actually, and now they were so productive that now this architecture is going to be used as a reference architecture, but it was absolutely an <coughs> at the beginning. We only have to wait until Whitefly becomes EAP, just like the EAP is the supposed Whitefly platform. This is only success story. Why uh, they were very afraid of AngularJS? Okay, this is uh, this is this is normal for Java developers, but uh, they, they they were very surprised that I didn't suggest any frameworks. So we don't have any external dependencies, absolutely no frameworks. And they ask me constantly, we need a framework and frameworks, I forget about frameworks, then build this and then we see whether we need frameworks or not. So right now, there is nothing, it's just vanilla and Java server. Questions? No questions? What's wrong with me? <laughs> <laughs> Java is E7's framework itself. Yeah, so, and uh, what, uh, it, it's a sickness in most enterprise projects, like they use, you know, um, Java E6 and Java E7, and then don't use anything from this. Instead of using what's there, they download everything else. So like you get to know the complete Java E server stack, and they use five percent of the Java E seven, and and everything else is uh, fancy on top, which is common. So um, in my eyes, there are two viable architectures in 2015. You build everything by yourself, like no uh, thin HTTP server with the whole stack, no problem. But you have maintained it, and there should be a team which maintains that. Or you say, I'm not interested in the platform infrastructure, and you go with Java 7, and if you like, buy the support or not. But the mix is dangerous. Like, you know, using Whitefly and then replacing 50% 50, 50 of Whitefly with more fancy framework, this is just, you cannot justify this. And I'm pretty sure about this, because I get lots of requests like task forces, task forces if something doesn't work, it should work, and the problem is, in 80% of all cases, some forgotten dependency. So there is a project which uses a framework which was fancy five years ago, and the framework disappeared from the internet, and because of a hardware change or um, a library upgrade, it doesn't work anymore. 
and uh, it, happens, it happens frequently. So what do you usually have to have? You know, decompile the library and recompile it and, and, and fix it, which is crazy. Okay? Agree? Mm -hmm. You have to. I'm the speaker, right? <laughs> so, uh, development process. So it was like several years ago, everyone, you know, the first two weeks was about development process. Do we use uh, XP programming, Agile, should we have a Scrum certification or whatever? And how it works right now, it's like, uh, I, I'm a little bit allergic about, uh, you know, all the processes. So I say, um, forget the process. Now, start coding, start hacking. And uh, in my eyes, there are two, two ways of developing, right? So um, I would say 9 to 5, German is Dienstagvorschrift, is like, tell me what to do and I will do it and nothing else. And forgot about this. If you, in this mode, you will never be productive. And the other way of operation is, I like to develop software. So in the second mode, what it means, you will be somehow agile and iterative because it's impossible to be wonderfulish and like software, right? If someone likes something, it will be never wonderfulish. Regardless of what you are doing. Sports, instruments, is never like you read you know, all the notes first and then play guitar one day. Everything is interactive, no? And uh, at the beginning of Enterprise Java, it's like, uh, you know, the, some geniuses thought we can draw everything on UML, and then we will code it once and it worked. It can never work. It, it never worked. So all successes, wonderful projects were actually not agile, but iterative. So now we got, at least in Germany, you know, the agile hive. So we talk more about the process than hacking. So it might stop talking about agile because everything else does work. So, I mean, everything has to be iterative. And for this iterative development, we get about 50 names. And uh, we need uh, five certifications, and instead of talking to each other, we have to have the house quality daily setups and all these servers. Some companies in Germany, there are more, more yellow sticky notes than actually lines of code on the wall. Why yellow? I don't know. It's like trademark. So, what happened? All successful projects, they just developed something. And uh, how it works? Build use case, deploy, test. Build use case, deploy, test. And what we introduce always delete code. So it was actually build, deploy, test, delete. So try to keep your code base simple. If you keep your, uh, keep your this is the highest priority ever. It sounds funny, but it was very important. In all successful projects so far, we try to delete the waste all the time. And we misuse things like um, code coverage. Code coverage is very popular in QA, they wanted to have some numbers. We misuse that to identify uh, that code. So um, if, you, if you test something, system test, and you have code which is not tested, it means you probably forgot. So if you delete it and everyone is happy, job done. Okay? And QA are also happy. So, development process. Build systems. So, um, so what I wanted to say, the um, development process, there was no process except we have a small team with motivated developers and they show to the site that they're better than this. But I would say everyone knows this. Everyone who would like to develop software knows uh, that it only iterate works. Everyone agree? Or is someone who, 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 who thinks we need to read a book that, to find out that we have to be iterative? I agree. So uh, this Agile is perfect for managers, not for developers. For developers it damages everything. Because what I saw in companies, you no know, highly Agile teams, they can consult and say, now we have to stand up, it's like, like kindergarten, you know. So, okay, now we stand up, and then we move up the wall around, it's okay, I mean, okay, we could also provide some dancing on the table as well to, to, to make a better team spirit, right? Build systems. I'm, I'm from Java space, so 90% of my project are Java. So what happens at the beginning, they ask me, why you use Maven and not Gradle? So um, what I always do, I show them a Gradle example, and I made an example, and what happens is they are almost identical, and Gradle is slower. So you see, we only need to build this. We have Java, you have single dependency, there will be no programming, nothing. There is just one dependency, and uh, they say, okay, but they really would like to have something different. So what I, what I, my assumption, meanwhile, is mo most of the developers don't like Java E because most of the problems are already solved. If you, if you, uh, there, there is nothing to play. You download the thing and you have to work. 
But if you start with, some, with an alternative, then everything starts with the playground. And it was from the beginning of Java, it was always this. At the beginning, the, uh, the main topic on, on user groups and everything was the IDE. Which IDE to use? So this was somehow solved because Eclipse was dominant, so there was no more discussion about this. So what was the next logging framework? This was the most interesting part of the world, logging. Then we got configuration. Then it was solved, then everything was aspect oriented. Then we found out, okay, there is no room for aspects actually, or this is, you, you didn't mention, I think, aspect only one, you only mentioned background, microservice, enterprise Java, and payload, the way your English words. <laughs> so, um, and uh, but there was no aspects. Uh, Ten years ago, it was everyone about aspects. We had aspects, alliance, and bytecode, and everything has to be aspect oriented to, to modularize software. And so, okay, uh, I, and now it's completely quiet. And if we see AOP, we, we, we refactor it out. Okay? Do you have recently talk about aspect oriented programming? Yeah? You see? So, what it actually means, the whole movement, you know, this uh, one year of discussion was completely wrong. You could redirect it to them now. Have it? So, what was the problem? No business case. All the use cases were the same. Yeah? Transactions, security, logging. But all frameworks solved already this. Java E, there was, there was, from the beginning we got transactions for free. There was no no room for aspects. Spring the same, okay? So, build systems, the same. Maven, if you just use Maven, it's incredibly simple. And I got the fancy mic because I'm allowed to show you something, some code. And I show you the uh, project, uh, the Maven Pong, which always. So, um, forgot NetBeans, I use NetBeans, but you could use IntelliJ, Eclipse, whatever. Um, the next thing is IDEs do not matter. In all my projects, I do whatever you like, it has to build on Jenkins. And there is no discussion. Because if you start with discussion with IDE, you will lose. There will be just discussion. You know? It's like Spricks versus Java E, or you can also discuss if, you, if this discussion is over, which probably won't be, is like uh, Eclipse, Eclipse already. There's no discussion about tips, intelligent or net This would be the next one. But if you have to, to have some free time use um, Eclipse, there's always time to find a plugin. So, uh, uh, <coughs> Microjump, I'm inspired. <laughs> Microclosure Jack. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, why I created the essential archetype is because anything else was longer than this. This is how all Java 7 projects, commercial or not, the bank project or startups will make this. This is the very beginning. Anything else is absolutely forbidden. All plugins are completely unusual. I'm just talking about Java E. Whatever else you have, I have no idea. You need, okay? So, in this, you get everything. What do you think? In more complex projects, the consultants do like this because it looks simple. What many people try to do to show how smart they are, they expand this and include servlet 2.1, EJB 3.1, and they show whatever they know. It's like you're actually crazy. Why? This is Java. If you have Java 6, you have to play 6 and you are done. Whatever you need, you have it. So this is the basic, the simplest possible uh, main project, and it won't grow. The only thing you will get in addition to this are test dependencies. Polish invention Mojito, the best ever because simple to use. Uh, Swiss invention uh, JUnit, I think they were Swiss, right? From, yeah, from Switzerland. And this basically was Archelian is exception from the rule. Oh, Archelian. No one comes to the idea in, in working projects to use Archelian to test getters and setters. The larger the project, the more uh, likely the developers will start to test getters and setters in embedded container. Why? I have no idea. And then they complain, you know, it takes hours. But of course, I mean, you could also, you know, uh, uh, invoke five aspects and start uh, a cluster to, to, to test to spring. It would also take even longer, right? So, um, what we do, we use for testing, we have a slide for testing, we just use JUnit Mojito at Preview. There's actually nothing, nothing special in Java Eco. And uh, because we do it frequently, REST Web Services, um, there are two configurations. So first, now we have configured uh, RESTful Web Services. Usually it's resources, sometimes it's API, and in rare cases, version. And um, what this does, this is XML, it never changes. What it means, I would like to have dependency injection everywhere. Period. So, um, everyone agree? 
So, and uh, because Randall is, um, is very similar to Maven in, in Java E case, and, but there are no Maven books on the market in Randall, uh, I didn't use Maven because it's more known than Randall, it's less discussion. Agree? You have to, or you have questions. So, try to build this micro pro jack. It builds in one second, Randall would build in two seconds. So, I we could argue with maybe you can save 50% of your time. Which is completely wrong, so it would be a good caption in our blog post or something. I should do it properly. So then, then my, <laughs> my blog will start and I'll be fine. Any questions about this? No questions. Then I show, then I saw in the closure block something with JSON, which looked very strange in Java. So I tried to fix this. So, copy annex, um, the application is hello, well, because I have no idea, and um, hello business, I will just exaggerate, um, messages boundary, and this is going to be messages resource, and this is going to be a half. <coughs> messages. So what I'm building right now is a nano service, I would call it. Not micro, this is the first talk. I know. If you have questions about microservices, you can do it later or now, whenever you like. Ask me if you like. I only think this is a dangerous, dangerous topic here, in your case. Create object builder is actually what I wanted to do. Add uh, payload, say payload, and <coughs> nice count. So this is how JSON looks in Java. As you can see, nothing horizontal, everything vertical. And it is far more concise than closure, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I would just run it, some service here. Um, what I wanted to say is, um, in uh, the vast majority of our cases, I, I have to say, in the last year, always, we had a REST service. The times of SOAP are over, and um, yeah, recently I was asked, yeah, first, so this was, uh, this was um, a REST service with JSON output, with full stack Java A7 and Payana, which is a patch glassfish um, from scratch with cold start. So this was the worst possible case. Um, okay, why I created so strange a uh, package structure? Because on the next slide, I would like to uh, introduce you a possible architecture we did. And this looks like this. I will explain you um, why it worked and how it worked. Any questions about this? Okay, at this point of time, um, this slide, or slide this, the editor kills data transfer objects. If we need data transfer objects, these are our transfer objects, JSON object. JSON object is actually a map. So if you go to and look at this, it is uh, a map, string in JSON value. And um, so if you have to transfer something, we transfer our domain objects, if we have them directly to JSON objects, but data transfer objects are dead, pretty dead. In all projects where I had the influence, we didn't use any DTOs, and I was a little bit concerned because very so many architects are very convinced and say, okay, you will see the decoupling or whatever, and nothing happened. Everyone was happy after years. So I can say data transfer objects are exception from the rule. Um, I perform now a code review for a project. They wasted, I would say, several months of work with data transfer objects. 90% of the data transfer objects are identical to the entities, absolutely identical. So um, actually, no one can cannot imagine uh, what the reason would be to build such a stuff. Okay? Still no questions. So with data transfer object, everyone said you are crazy. We need data transfer object, there's decoupling and whatever. Okay, the next thing, communication between, between uh, wars, also interesting. So there are also two modes, we also learned this. The first mode is type-safe mode. What type-safe mode is, 
if one such a war changes the API, all other wars, wars have to be not compilable. So we, we use the Java compiler and don't even try to implement interfaces, whatever, to hide the structure. But this is really convenient. So if you have to release everything at once, I think type safety is a good idea because the compiler is on your side. So, but more and more internet services, if we build services to the outside world, we don't know the clients. We don't need who invokes us. So we cannot do something like this with XML schema or JSON schema or whatever, that if we you know, add, add, add new attribute, we'll break all the clients. This is crazy. So in this particular case, it is a lot better to test more often and use non type safe data structures like JSON. And in the recent project, we just use JSON. It worked well. If you do this, you cannot afterwards say, I would like to have, I don't know what, CSV or whatever. JSON. Yeah, you could do this, but it's a little bit harder. But if you ask, would explore here a Java object, a domain object, you could afterwards convert it to whatever like. Okay, this is too deep, but I would say most of the project, recent project were REST, no more so, and the vast majority was JSON because what was the decision? I, I was able to convince the architects just because of, you know, iOS, Android, and, and Angular, and no one is interested in SOAP and XML in it. Also not in Poland, right? Probably. Inverse. So, build systems, maybe. Uh, continuous integration with always changes. So there were projects were more fancier. There was there, there are additional features of Bamboo and King City, I think. Um, they, they are even more efficient, but uh, I, I would say Jenkins was everywhere. So it was no answer, just Jenkins. So user interface. This was interesting. So um, the um, Commercial projects um, tend to use AngularJS uh, enterprise. Boring enterprise projects, they somehow went with uh, AngularJS or, or, yeah. And what struck me the most is the, uh, the uh, startups decided to use Java server bases. And I say, you are crazy. I mean, uh, usually, exactly. But uh, the, the, the reasoning and the idea was clear. The main reason was, if you are in the enterprise, you get, you know, the design from a crazy department, which is pixel perfect, and you have to build this, period. With GSF, it's sometimes hard. So if you buy components from time faces, let's say, and they look uh, different to your, to, to, to the ideas of the business department, forget it. With, with Angular, you can do this. But all these startups are very pragmatic. They say, okay, I would, would like to have a table here. Now, whether the table is pixel perfect or not, I don't care, it should work. And there was one startup from, uh, from uh, Krakow, they, uh, they, 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 I performed, I forgot the name, from the interview with them, they, they actually met at Geekon, at the conference. Yeah, it was uh, Geekon that, that they approached me and told me this. And, um, and uh, the other one was Tippicab, so there are many projects, and, and all these startups actually use JSF. And one start, uh, startup was a larger one, it was called Stylite, so I uh, was also interviewed my blog. They're, they're a huge company actually. And they use uh, struts, old struts, and I ask them, why are you using struts? And they say, okay, if we rent on server, it is better visible for CEO of Google. If you would use AngularJS, you have to use, you know, how is pre-render or whatever, you have to use additional JavaScript frameworks to be more uh, accepted by the robots, which was interesting. So, but user interface, the user UI, what, what, what I found out is, if someone find, found, started to use JSF because they like the components, the project were successful. And this is, I would say, the first thing, absolute anti pattern what I saw in the project is, is like one, you know, genius architect decided to use JSF because it's standard or whatever, without looking at the components. Then someone else does the design, and the, and the, and the poor developer has to match the design with prime faces. And what usually happens, you have to extend the components. And extending the components is criminal. So if you start with this, it was never meant this way. So GSF can be only, and was only very productive, if you are happy with the components, which is abs which could absolutely work. So how we did this in, in, in larger companies, we went with the components, component case from Angular or whatever, we went to the business department, the user said, look, you get the app, but it will look exactly like this, it's demo case. Anything else does work, period. Take this or nothing. And this worked. 
What doesn't work, you know, you just take GSF as the solution for everything, and developers will fork private bases. This is criminal. I, I mean, this is this, this will never work, and then the, the, you spend the whole of magnitude more time. So, so surprisingly, when GSF worked, worked work perfectly because it was decision based on components, not the framework. And um, other projects, Angular JS, and it was also fine because it didn't try to, to exaggerate. You know, there was no no fancy how it's called the transpilers, transpilers, or directives. Yeah. So IDEs. Uh, I have to say it's very pragmatic. There is a more uh, less worse, uh, worse than it was before. Um, I would say IntelliJ is is getting ground and like crazy. So uh, uh, it was an absolute minority, but it's, it's really more popular. More po popular. Um, NetEase as well, and Eclipse is losing ground in Java East space at least, uh, which uh, from my point of view is natural. So I, I, I performed some, some workshops with Eclipse and it was hell on earth until all plugins were installed was the workshop almost over. I mean, uh, you have to hit the workspace and do whatever, so it's just like... So I think um, what works well with Eclipse is the uh, Red Hat Developer Studio. It's like super experience to IntelliJ or, or, or NetBeans, you can download everything in one go and do no questions, so this was whatever I wanted to do. So don't care about the successful projects that they used to know everything at the same time and no one care. So this is actually how, how it should be. Um, questions? So don't try to prescribe IDs to developers, so is actually the message. Um, protocols. Um, so um, what, what I have to say, IOP is absolutely dead and remote communication in enterprise space, no, because, not because IOP is uh, not suitable for this, I would say because it is not that supported by the application server. So this is um, less and less popular amongst developers, so the whole stack is not maintained very well. In the performance characteristics, what are even found, found in some application servers, that the REST was orders of magnitude faster than IoT, which actually is impossible, but it was. And the problem was the implementation of the org. So I would say uh, IoT is uh, not that interesting in the future, and, and it is, I think in Java 8 is going to be optional. So, um, um, what is the protocol of the future, I would say, is the HTTP and REST. Why this protocol of the future? Because uh, everyone agreed on this. Even Microsoft, you know, Oracle, everyone is on the, on the HTTP side. And so, is losing like crazy. So, I, um, the architect didn't, didn't want to believe me, so what I did, some research, you know, amount of talks, amount of articles, and what was the last update of the spec? This is, it looks completely dead for me. Okay? You also mentioned ESP, <coughs> Enterprise Service Bus. So um, the uh, ESPs is almost not existing in my projects anymore. And uh, in my current projects, we were asked by the department to use it. And I asked a simple question, what problem does it solve? There was no answer, basically. Like, we are the central hub or whatever. It's like, no, I'm a developer. No, if I use this, how much time will it save me? What is the solution? There was no solution. And what I what I always say if someone thinks about ESP, let's implement the integration with Pojos first, see how it works, and then migrate to ESP. So to get a feeling because it's not like ESP is super popular, it was uh, still the program the the beast, right? So um, two choices, I would say. What I understand on the rest in enterprise is you have HTTP and if you're business, you should build API. So if you look at the API, a user or business person should understand what's going on. So this was really successful in the startups um, or in enterprise because we didn't have to document a lot. So we created this with Swagger, we generated the code with Swagger, and we were basically set. It worked perfectly. What didn't work well, many developers try to misuse JAX or REST for remote procedure communication, RPC. So, and I would say there are two modes. Try to think about APIs and try to emphasize the business concepts. Well, your, your company is like money transfer. So the, in, the, in the REST API, there should be at least transfer for money. But if there is no get details for account, this is not an API. This is not a REST API. This is a remote procedure called API. What you could do with REST, you could model the remote procedure stack. So what you could do, you could say, you know, get invocations, and you get all invocations of a service, or services invocations, so you get like reflection, all the possibilities, post, to this. So either model the remote procedure, 
or do a business modeling with REST, but not both. Runtime. Surprisingly, lots of Docker. And Docker was uh, never officially actually supported. What he did would request the virtual machine, and within the virtual machine, we installed Docker. So this was actually the, the hack, because the, it was not fully supported by the operations, so guerrilla tactics. Um, why we did this? We had done more control of what happens inside, and we could um, create in our Jenkins pipeline the, um, the application, and when the application was built in the integration stage, and we can put it in production with minor changes. Um, so I think Docker is a hype, but it's a good one. This is like, you know, already existing technology um, repackaged in a more usable way. So this is why it took off, because it's very easy to use and it's based on old technology, which is bulletproof, like LXC, gels, and, and zones. So runtime was uh, Docker with Java 8, and I also heard microservices, and this is also so my understanding. So everyone, I was at the uh, Actually, Geekon, one of the conference, Geekon, was it a DevOps or Geekon? I think it was Geekon. Someone uh, came to me afterwards and, and, and said, uh, yeah, but the Java E is not a microservice ready. Like, why not? Yeah, it, um, it is too public, whatever. But what turns out that Java E is perfectly suitable for microservices on Docker. And the, uh, if you think about this, if you probably know, Docker has an inheritance. So what we did in Docker always, we had one base Java image with all the tools required, SSH, daemon or whatever. The application server inherited from the Java image. And now comes the interesting part. The application image was just a war. And what you learned from the first slide, the war is almost empty. There are no libraries. So our Docker images are tiny. So if you build 100 times a day, this is incredibly fast. Because what Docker does, it only builds for changes, and this is copyright uh, file system. So um, what, 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 what turns out that the fat jars are extremely bad idea in Docker, because if you would have the fat jar, there is no separation between infrastructure and your business logic code. So each build will be huge and take forever, not forever, it will be three times slower than, I don't know. So it was it funny? And then ask someone at Geekon, why this? They say, yeah, but our paper was built before Docker. So okay, okay, then. then. And you answered it my question. Right? So um, it's not of course, of course accident in Java E, but what happened is with uh, the Docker builds with Java E were all those magnitudes faster than, than, than anything else. And this is also my, my, my feedback from, from, from the community and projects. Still no questions? I mentioned microservices and Docker. Oh. Yeah, I have a question. Very good. Uh, do you use Docker as a runtime environment or also as a build environment? In uh, two project is runtime. And, and not build I and mean, test and integration. So it looks like we have one, we have images in, we have pipeline which runs in a central server, and locally there is no Docker except where we develop the Docker images. Okay. So you do everything in the uh, IDE, and then you push Git usually. Oh, Git is also uh, used a lot. So there's still some version there, but Git is uh, very popular. And then there is a, I was called publish hook or something. Not not. Yeah, and this triggers the Jenkins build. Okay, so uh, on Jenkins still you need to have all uh, all dependencies installed, yes? Like Maven, like, I don't know, other tools needed to build your application. Yes, and uh, having that said, there is a trick in Jenkins. What we do is like, we do not install the dependencies on the machine. We let Jenkins install the dependencies on the machine, because if you get Jenkins slaves, there's nothing to do, you know, you can spin up a slave and then it starts from, this is a small trick. But uh, what we only have is made in Java 8, and for the plugins we have um, pipeline plugin, which makes a nice picture, and copy workspace plugin, not to recompile everything, and this is performance plugin to, to visualize the stress test, but there are only few plugins in Jenkins. And what I think about this automation of building the pipelines, because there's always the same, but we are I'm consulting and working for too many companies, so it is not worse to do this. But if I were one company, I would create a template in order to create a pipeline over and over again. Yeah, so Docker is used, either it is used everywhere or nowhere. Yeah. Automation. So I'm um, also fancy. Uh, a few years ago, no one was interested in automation. So you know how the deployment looked like? They opened the application server web, uh, web admin page, uh, clicked on the search button, they looked at the file system for the war, 
click on the war and deploy it. You know, of course, the fig, you know, five times are different wars. And right now, what all projects started is with automation. And what we did is, instead of using shell scripts, because uh, at one point of time they, they, they are uh, too, too complex, we use Nasron scripts, which turned out to be really interesting, because Nasron says, uh, Nasron comes with Java 8, and on Windows, um, you, there is no shell of Windows, obviously, but you can say JJS on execute the Nasron script, and on Linux, on Unix, you can use the JJS as the system scripting language. So we use Nasron for automation of everything. So mainly how it works on the local machine, we have Nasron scripts, and the Nasron scripts do something, create application server, domain, and, and install everything. And the same scripts are running on Jenkins. So, um, so what the Jenkins or the pipeline just was, was like, you know, pipelining that already existed scripts. So, and five years ago, it was like there was one department, CI department, who built everything from scratch and never worked. And what we did, our scripts were just, you know, automated objectives. And this worked well. Okay, so uh, why last one? Because you can debug last one. This is a big deal. So if I go to, to NetBeans, and if you like, I can show you this, you can write a script, a system script, and I could debug the script and breakpoints, and this is huge. So I, 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 I don't know, the shell is a little bit hard with debugging. That's is extremely easy. And uh, it is portable. I had some problems with shell and no arrays and the escapes. There's no such problem in NASM. NASM is JavaScript. If you don't know, it's ECMA 5 JavaScript. Right? ECMA 5, not 6. <laughs> okay. Questions about the, the system thing? Wait a second. Probably a bit Containers? Docker status. Which docker status? Now, this is my internal URI. This is a very simple script, but this is a nice one actually. And what it does is, it uses a curl, because I was too lazy here to execute. And the cool story is, the output is parsed using the ECMA5 parse. So what I get here are two JSON objects, so I can iterate over all the Docker images. So this was the first time, this was just, a, just an example. And we have such scripts for everything, from creating application server, for, for publishing, and this was a lot easier doing this with a, with a shell. So this is a mix of, usually my scripts are like a mix of uh, JavaScript, uh, system commands, and, uh, and Java. You can easily call Java code. So it's really great for automation. Okay? So, and, um, yeah. I think, could I actually create a new... I don't know whether in this project it would work. <coughs> JavaScript. I forget it. So um, if you like, I will create a new project later, not a war, and uh, just a folder actually, and then I could execute uh, system scripts um, directly and debug it. It is also possible with IntelliJ and Tips, it's nothing specific in NetBeans here, it's just because it's Java as possible. And Tips, of course, given you find the right plugin. So, um, automation, testing. This is like the, the one of the most asked questions, like uh, how to test Java applications, so over and over again. And my answer is always no difference to your, to your Java SE code. So, um, why do you bother with one additional annotation request code or one additional annotation stateless? No one cares about this. So, uh, what happens usually if we have complex code and it's going to be tested with unit tests, straight unit tests? If uh, this is not enough, so if you have to, for instance, test the queries against a database, we write integration tests. 
And uh, there is a clear separation in data between unit tests and integration tests. Everything which ends with tests is unit tests, and everything which ends with IT is integration tests. And it's a best practice to separate this. Why? Because of speed. Unit tests are crazy fast. If you separate this way, we are able to execute hundreds of unit tests in seconds. And integration tests only run after successful unit tests. So it takes longer, but no one cares, because we get the first feedback after seconds. So our pipeline, I could draw on the GFT stuff. So uh, on uh, the pipeline looks like unit tests, integration tests, build application server, start application server, deploy app, and run system tests. So it's getting slower and slower and slower, but you get feedback all the time. And the feedback we get with um, We get yeah, some version. Yeah, Jen Jenkins is connected, and I get here notifications what breaks and what doesn't. So I get the icebergs in there. I don't have to wait and watch the Jenkins page. Okay, so this was um, about testing, um, embedded testing like uh, CDI unit, Delta Spike, or Achillean are exception from the rule. We only use this. To, uh, to test unusual stuff. Like, let's say, for instance, you would like to inject loggers. This is my canonical example for this. And if you inject the logger, you would probably would like to configure the logger properly. So the injected logger should be configured with the name of the class. Agreed? So how to test this? So for this purpose, you have to use Achillean. It is impossible to use it with unit tests. But this is absolute exception from the rule um, in, in my project. It's not like we do it all the time, you know, we're not, not injecting uh, fancy stuff. And by the way, all the fancy stuff is also exception from the rule. It's also, also, also funny. All the questions I get at conferences, Java user group meetings, it's like, can you inject, you know, with qualifier? Can you inject dynamically or whatever? This doesn't matter. 80% of our stuff is that simple. We inject one pojo, no interfaces, no variations, nothing. That simple code. Boring. Okay? So uh, what I show you usually on stage is more fancy with a uh, project. The project it looks like Java SE. There's almost no Java E. Okay? So, now testing. We only have four hours. Adam, four to five hours, no more, right? Yeah. I have, my flight goes back at uh, 6 a.m., I think, 5.50 or something. So, at four, I have to leave. So what I created a sample project, you can also install it, it's, um, that's uh, because it, it demonstrates here some ideas. So first, test is a GUI test. Before, yeah, someone asked me how to more queries, I walked the query out, it's just it's just a very simple, very simple unit test. It has nothing to do with Java 8. It's just business logic. So what we also have, integration tests. And this particular integration test, also one of the most asked questions, how to test persistence. And I did it the brute force way. I booted the whole persistence with this line of code. And what is booted is specified in the test dependency of Maven. I got the transaction and now I can test outside the container the persistence. I don't have to boot the container. I only there is some persistence. So I can start here the persistence framework, Eclipse or Hibernate, without changing the code. I could start, uh, bin, uh, I could test bin validation without starting the container. So there's almost nothing left, except, I try to find this, this one here. Again, the code is in the main repository, it's by PCE. If you perform this, you can, you can just try it at home. This is uh, Archelian. What Archelian is, is an embedded container tester. So what it does, or, or JLint runner, it, uh, it, it's able to perform actions before the unit test actually starts. And in this particular case, it, um, it starts the weld dependency injection framework. And the killer, killer use case here is, Archelian is able to create on the fly the archive, the war or jar, and in this particular case, I only I would like to just deploy the three classes. So you, you probably see already the killer use case of Archelian. If we have something like a plugin, 
I could test it very well with Archilead because I can decide, you know, I will deploy two classes, two plugins, one plugin or no plugin, and see how the application behaves. Without Archilead, I will have to use branches or whatever. It is impossible to test this. So with Archilead, I'm able to eliminate all mocks from my source main Java. So in source main Java, in the production code, in Java A project, in the, in the recent Java A project, there were no mocks, no test support classes, nothing, because we could load everything during the test from source slash Java. Questions? But Archilean is exceptional. It's really exceptional. So it's not like use it for everything. I have to you know, find something here to show you Archilean. And of course, uh, the, this class was implemented just to test the log injection, and this class is loaded from source job. So I'm not sure whether it actually will test, I don't know whether it needs ports, I actually forgot what I, what I did here. But it even worked. So the whole dependency injection container was started in, in 0 0.8 seconds, because it was well, it was not the whole container just well. I could, of course, build, if you like, uh, I could also put here uh, Whitefly, Glassfish, or the more I put, the slower it gets. So this is what I meant. There are projects which, for each test, I don't know, for uh, to testing, you know, the, the, the Fed computation, they, they put the servers, okay, something wrong. Agree? Why everyone asks so many questions to you? For me, everything is in here. Like, <laughs> testing. Oh. And the most forgotten thing is stress testing. So um, actually, I get lots of questions like, um, you know, uh, application server consume too too much memory, or application server are too slow, or whatever. And and I, I don't get it because at the first iteration we test it, we see it exactly. And I've heard it already. You know, the application server are too slow it doesn't actually run. Yeah, it still runs or consumes too much memory. So the first thing you can do, JVisual VM, comes with Java, and this something, this happens, no? This doesn't happen in the real world somehow. I go to the monitor, perform GC, and say, my class which is the application takes 50 max RAM right now. So it means if we get miracle technology, something else, it will take one megabyte. I don't believe it, but let's say there is a framework out there it's written in Java which takes one megabyte heap. It means we could save 49 megabytes of RAM. I don't know how it's in Poland, but in Germany it will probably mean two cents or three cents or whatever. So 50 megs of RAM you cannot buy it usually. Okay? If this would be you know, one gig, this I think this is something which you can at least buy. Let's say this is five euro or ten euros, but 50 meg, saving 50 meg doesn't matter. And no, and they say one byte, we can, we can save 50 megs, and then, then they're talking about uh, fed jars, and on each deployment of Docker, then they're, they're wasting, I don't know how, how much, uh, 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 hundreds of megabytes data. Okay, and this is stock Payara, is, uh, with, uh, I think, I don't know what, minus X and X is, uh, 500 megabytes. If I would use less than this, it would, um, it would also take less memory, because it would be more pressure. So, yeah. What about end-to-end? End-to-end -end test. This is what I think system tests are. So, um, what we do, we have the, uh, the okay. Ah, oh, I should give you my USB stick or something, right? There is. You have to, to, to get one. This is not about you, you want or not. Please. So, um, very good. So the question was, um, this is the end-to-end -end test. This, uh, this is the system test, and what I do for each war, there is a dedicated jar without any dependency to the war, be realistic, and this contains just the tests to test um, the restful web services. So, yeah, but I need to test with, uh, like opening the browser, trying to Oh, okay. Um, this is the end-to-end -end test, which is absolutely mandatory. So this is with the uh, Jax rs 2 client. And from this, what we can do, in current project what we did, oh, here is one such a candidate, crowd. What you can easily do, you can modify, make it this way, this way, that it will create a jar with all dependencies. And then you can launch JMeter and say, run this jar 500 times. And you get a very basic uh, stress test without any additional uh, overhead. So to get a basic idea of what behaves. End-to-end -end test means functional test with the UI. We use something different. 
I think it's not part of the example, but I could find it. Um, I use um, also Arcadian with extension called Graphene. And what Graphene does is it is able to inject you the browser as a drone. The name is a drone. And this, uh, like Graphene, but simpler. It uses Graphene behind the scenes, but it simplifies. So there is a page object with injection. And you can inject the page objects and invoke uh, methods. So it's called Graphene. Like, you know, the, uh, so this is what we use in such cases. And in the Angular apps, for me, it was simpler to use um, Graphene with Angular than Protractor and, and Angular. So Protractor for me is like, <coughs> I don't know, hard. Hard. Protractor is for unit testing of the project. Yeah. It just tests the. But it also uses Selenium, yeah. But not to test the like, uh, logging or, or see how it, uh, the message is coming to the screen or not. Just, it's a unit test for. Yeah, the, but yeah. The, the graphene is like, it uses the web driver. So you, so you have you can manipulate it all. You, you can you can query it all. Graphene. If you really would like to see, I have an example somewhere. So okay. But uh, this is like it looks exactly the same. You can inject uh, the drone and um, and then say you know open, wait until something happens. And there are different selectors you can find with CSS IDs and uh, class names and stuff like this. Okay, testing. Okay, stress testing means the last successful build of a day is automatically checked out and the whole night is spent trying to break the server. So what I would like to see is the more load we can generate, the more I try... So what happens the first night? The first night the application that survives. So regardless how, how trivial the application is, it always breaks. And we try to build the, um, or to configure the applications of a dead way that it at least survives the night. And students were the best test, test drivers. We say, okay, here is the JMeter, here is the hardware to try to break our server. It was the, uh, so, and, and we found a lot of problems, not only in our app, surprisingly, um, uh, also in the application server, of course, and sometimes in JVM, and once even on the host system. So, host means uh, mainframe. So, uh, test was a little bit too heavy, but there was a bug, currency bug in the, in the mainframe. So, um, so stress testing, system testing, end-to-end, -end, not so, but system testing and stress testing, in my eyes, absolutely mandatory. Integration testing, very important for me for productivity, otherwise it's really hard to build queries. So what you did, all the complex queries were, uh, were developed, actually, using integration tests. We never developed to the, to the application server so to test our queries, crazy. Okay? Architecture. So this is actually the architecture, and this is why I opened the project. And this worked well, I, and I got from everywhere nice feedback, actually. Only once in a conference in Poland, actually, someone had better names. But um, <coughs> what is the success factor in enterprise? Uh, one question to your, to your talk. Is your company or is your project a project or a product? So are you building to just this, or are you building multiple stuff? Like OK, this is a completely different zone, you see? So what I'm talking about here, with most projects. So we have to build something and then we build something different. So if you build a product, you have to think a little bit different. So you can, you have, so this is the, the, the main difference probably. But, um, so, what you can see here is the, the, the project is virtual registrations and um, what happens is the following. So the first is of course company name, that is the application name, it does not actually matter. If we have um, different layers, Let's say uh, we have UI, like Java server faces, let's say. Then we have business, and we have something like SAP or something in backend. Then you get three packages here. It's like business, presentation, and integration. And all the layers would be in one world. There would be no different words. Um, if there is just the REST service, you could skip the business. So this is just a minor practice. But what's absolutely crucial in my eyes is the following. There are no technical packages. Exceptions, common, utils, foundation, base, factories, everything, DTOs, no one cares about this. Business cares about business. So all the top level packages have business names. So it means in your case, I would, we have money, transfer, customer, or something like this. But not DTOs, Java beans, exceptions, who cares about this? And this is for other reasons, a sickness of enterprise projects, the developers 
are thinking in, I don't know, beans and java beans or whatever, and they forgot about the order. Okay? So, in, in all recent projects, all packages were at business names. So, this boundary control entity is very, very old pattern, and you can model this pattern with all tool I know from Grefel to Visio and uh, all UML tools, boundary control entity. What it means is entity are all domain objects, they are persistent objects. Um, control, uh, this is actually a test, but it's the same structure. Um, the control is something which is reusable, and the boundary is the, um, is the interface to the outside world. So now, and this is the hardest part. I don't know why, but this is the hardest to explain in projects. I get, I get a thousand questions over and over again. How it is developed? It's the following. We start with one project. If we get persistence, we probably start with the persistence and then with this project. So what you get first is like transfer and transfer interface or transfer whatever. Um, so, and at one point in time, the transfer whatever gets to be. Thousand lines of code. So what you get then, you will, you will split this to a control, divide and conquer. So you will introduce smaller projects on demand. And this is what many don't, don't get. So what I see a lot, they create everything from the beginning and say, oh, we need boundary control, and then boundary is empty, control is empty, and entity has one field. Completely wrong. So how the projects worked is Java E is uh, fully clear. Yeah. I have also a design, design a slide. There were no interfaces, no patterns, nothing. Just POJOs with business people. Boundary, this is the uh, interface of the outside world. It's like the business API. Control is optional. And entities, if you have persistent if entities. They don't have to be JPA entities. You could store them in one project, you use also Mongo with uh, object relational mapping. And in other projects, Sunda, whatever. Everyone agreed? So why the strange names? Because the strange names are for 30 years were invented by Albert Jacobson. And with this strange names, I didn't have to argue anymore. I said, look, there's an old book, there's a standard, don't discuss about the names. Before this, I introduced my own names. So my invention was, I think, uh, the same service and domain. And in all projects, I got questions, don't know, why not call it composite service or whatever. And there's, okay, let's talk. It took, I, I tried to find whatever standard. This has to be a standard. I found the book, and since then, no piece, no meetings, nothing. Just use the names of three. And uh, the great story is the icons. You can model the icons. Um, I cannot draw anything. There are also a pencil or something. Can you give me a. Can I just use the GFT or is it. No, no I think. <laughs> so, um, oh, wait, wait a second. This actually work. So, so this would be the um, the boundary. You saw the icon already. This is the control. This is one of the oldest oldest icons. So with this, everyone can model. And all architects are happy. This was this was originally implemented in Smalltalk to model MVC. But it, it works surprisingly well with Java as well. So, and this was the best feedback ever because developers say, okay, this is just this, don't think, no patterns, we go with this, everyone was happy. And particularly happy were uh, these startups. This is my first question. Are you happy with the decision? Perfect. Okay? So this was the PCE, boundary control entity. So and the design is how do the um, what we did, no patterns, absolutely forbidden. So no service locators there, business delegates there, uh, session facets there, data access object don't need it, DTO don't need it, uh, service activator completely dead is one annotation. We have no time to go over the patterns, but I can prove that all the patterns actually go. Um, no inheritance. So many projects also are sickness in enterprise. So a genius architect you know, comes down and introduces abstract classes. So like entity, one entity with get ID and calls it I don't, identifiable. Then the then, uh, <laughs> an entity inherits from identifiable and is version of it with another get. It's like, uh, are we so stupid that you cannot, and uh, if there are five layers of abstraction and there is nothing inside. And I cannot just stop it. So, and even worse is on, on service layer. So in one project, <laughs> they build controls with about 100 met methods. But if you inherited from this, you couldn't implement everything. And some of the methods were abstract, 
So you have to inherit, implement the method, and then say unsupported throw unsupported operation exception to demonstrate that you don't need it. As again, you are completely crazy, right? So absolute no inheritance and boundary control, um, really. So I cannot I cannot remember any case where it was from in Java where, where it was um, um, with added value. No interactions, so it means no interfaces, no no builders, no no uh, data data uh, access objects and details, and then simple design. So what we really say, if we can remove something, remove it from the beginning. Don't write super fluid code. This is the hardest part, I think. I have to say we spend a lot of time just deleting deleting or removing code. And the problem, someone asked monolith. You, you, you mentioned monolith several times. The problem with Java in monolith is 20% functionality and 80% bloat. And if you would remove the 80% of bloat, what remains is the business logic, and then we're talking. So what remains, can we split it or not? But usually what, what uh, the code is even generated sometimes, it's crazy. If you, if you are able to generate code, it's something completely wrong anyway. Because uh, you, you are able to transform one metadata to another representation, which is always the application. Still everyone agreed? Incredible. This is the most controversial slide in the Java user group era, right? Uh, continuous integration and continuous de de uh, uh, deployment um, is, act is actually common sense, so no one argues with it anymore, we just do it. Learning curve, surprisingly low. So Java E, someone asked me, you know, whether I'm Java E expert, say no. The problem is, you sh it's not like you have to start and read all the Java E specs. This is actually uh, impossible. Uh, possible. It's, it's actually, the, uh, they are shorter than HTML and type specs. So it is absolutely possible. So you could argue Java E is orders of magnitude simpler than HTML5. But um, the truth is, an average enterprise project, you only need a fraction of this. And the fraction is, a, it means you need a little of CDI, not even scopes. Um, and um, if, you, if you look, uh, for instance, what you said once, X8 transactions. So these are concepts. It's nothing to do with Java E. If you would, if you if you have to understand isolation levels, transactions, or or two-phase commit, you have to understand in I don't know in the .NET case, in, in Java E case, and in, in host case, this is nothing to do with the uh, complexity of, of Java E. And this argumentation is also over. At the beginning, I heard a lot, you know, we don't need transactions, though we don't need Java E. So okay, man, this is uh, stupid. I mean, transactions is actually great if you can use them because it's very convenient. If you cannot use transactions. Then you have to think about patterns, so it's more complicated, but if you can use transactions, just use them. So, so the learning curve is, is, is flat if you don't exaggerate. So, um, so what it means, you probably will need five annotations and you are able to build simple Java applications. So REST was completely misused often. It was on the REST one. It was JAXA REST, HTTP, and this was like everything was get. In one project, they were able to delete stuff with get. And, 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 the, and I couldn't convince them until the uh, internal uh, search engine uh, deleted half of the, of the portal because it closed the GET request, of course. So, um, so dangerous stuff. So, um, SCM. So, um, for uh, GIT was in most projects, but in Germany we have Java Magazine. This is this Java Magazine with the E. And they, a few years ago, they uh, printed a, a poster with Git, how the gurus use Git. And there's you no know, lots of branches and all this stuff. And for other reasons, the poster hangs in all companies. And if I enter a company, the first question is you know which use case or which approach I'm using. And what I'm suspecting already, you know, the, the ask the authors, you know, what you would use. And the auto set to do something, you know. So now oh, I'm branching, you know, 100 times on the other side, 500 times. So in my current project, I was asked, you know, um, we we have to branch. It's like why? If you are happy with master, go with master. It's like no, uh, why not? It's like would you like to branch? I mean, why? And what I what I what I um, what we did is usually we worked with master, and of course we take all successful builds, and if we have a problem, then we created a branch, but the branch was not a best practice. 
if you have an average developers in an uh, enterprise project, you have the problem they, you, they know properly subversion and they are scared of merging anyway. So if you have lots of branches, uh, the first question is merge or rebase. And I would say go as long as possible with master. It works perfectly in smaller teams. Um, or feature branches, but don't get crazy like Git. So I think Git itself, if you look how Git is developed, they have several hundred parallel branches. It is not a best practice for, for enterprise. And um, there was a best practice actually, trunk only in subversion days, and there's the same as a master. So just try to push the master, and uh, if you can live without branches, it's good. Um, with Git, it's possible, subversion branching is even, even heavier. Okay, this. Organizational overhead is still available, for instance, uh, uh, you know, to get internet connections or, or VPN port can be very challenging. In one project, where the project was almost over, then we get the first instance of Jenkins because uh, we are able to install the server. Or in another project, I got a server, but um, I was not able to install anything on the server. I say, okay, you didn't send us, then we need something to install. Yeah, but I'm a software provider, and how can you give the server without Jenkins and get a different one? To, uh, for four weeks again. Politics, of course, and the costs. So uh, we had it already. Uh, I don't know why we got a Docker uh, build system with two gigabyte hard disk. So it, I mean, what they are saving, right? So I, I, I don't know what is the smallest possible disk you can buy in media market. Probably one terabyte. You know, our project was a mid-range project. I don't know mid-range. Five developers is say mid-range for a company and they try to save no, five euros with hard disk, what is the problem? So I ask you if you if you for Christmas you get two disks for me because I mean I couldn't stand it. So and what happens of course the disk went full and everything stopped, right? So this is what we can and Linux and Docker is not that fun fancy. So we had all the we had to delete manually all the device and device and stuff like this, right? So crazy stuff. And um, so in my opinion hardware does not cost anything. What really costs money is power, but it doesn't no one is interested in this, surprisingly. But um, hardware should be uh, should be should be really cheap. But it isn't. This is why you get you no know, crazy crazy rules like uh, we only uh, have to right now. I have to build a project with 500 megabytes of RAM, a Java project. It works surprisingly well. But I'm really angry that I have to think about it because uh, the savings are in, 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 in euros or cents. Okay, probably one not you. So, microservices, now we're talking, right? It's almost, um, um, I didn't create this, the, 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 the slides uh, at, uh, during the talk, it was before, in the airplane. How it works is like this. The companies build something and they have no idea what they built. So it is terrible and doesn't work. Then they call me and say, um, we would like to have uh, microservices. How? How we can do this? And after explaining how it could work, they are no more interested. And uh, I actually have no idea what you, what you said with microservices, except payment background and stuff. But the problem, I think, um, or the problem, what microservice is, the, the main challenge in microservices is first to understand, really deeply understand the business logic. Without this, forget it completely. So if you understood the business logic, you will be able to identify independent parts of your software. So and in Java E world, these are wars. The wars are the independent parts. So, if you don't know the business logic, you will probably identify you now two wars which are which have too much in common. It just won't work. So, and um, what happened in all the projects? There were no microservices because if you have a crappy code, if you try to split the crappy code, you get even more code because microservices come for free. You will have to think about the communication protocol between the. Uh, the, the, the parts, and it can be easy as before. Um, having that said, the bank project was actually a microservice project from the beginning, but we never mentioned microservices. I never mentioned, they never mentioned it just occurred. Why? From day one, they said, um, we have this parts, this uh, application parts, and the life cycle is completely different. So it was obvious that this part is going to deploy it on Monday and this on Friday. So, and if you have such a thing, you cannot deploy a monolith. Because it means the, the monolith has to be deployed several times a, 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 a week, and all have to coordinate, so forget about it completely. So what we did from day one, we had wars, which were completely independent from each other. 
Again, this was not a product, it was a project. Yes? What was the problem with deployment several times a week? What was the problem? With deployment several times a day a week. Why would you deploy a top of the floor? Like, why would you deploy a couple of times a day? Would be reverse. Sorry? What you are saying, why, why we deploy it several times a week? You, you said the reason to go to Microsoft is that one part deploys on Monday and the other on Friday. Yes. And in the monolith, you would need to deploy on Monday and Friday. Yes. Why not deploy on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? You need inverse them. Of course. Yeah, I mean, if you have monolith, and everyone, every change to the monolith will cause the monolith to redeploy, and the re to redeploy every day, then every day has to be redeployed. Yeah. But if you have seven microservices, then each changed microservice would be deployed at the given day. Agreed? This is nothing to do with Java, it's just basic understanding. You are on my side. So what you said is even worse. If the more you deploy, the worse it gets. The more you deploy, the better it gets, right? No. It's safer. You deploy a smaller bit, so it's safer. Yes. This is why we did this. We didn't have the monolith. So we had eight, eight wars, which were completely independent from, from each other. Okay. Why? Because we have to independently deploy. But you could have one big one and deploy it every time you change every little bit. Yeah, this could also work. The problem is you get also the coordination between teams. You know, the, you have one build pipe that's not eight, it was, everything would be more complicated in this case. This is like, you have, you know, eight teams or eight departments, you can forget it completely in practice. Yeah. This, this, would, this, would, this would never work. But the problem was the problem, the communication between The problem was also a problem because uh, potentially when one, uh, uh, one department would like to redeploy, the other one is not okay with the decision. They would like to deploy a little later. Why? Hmm? Why postpone the problem? You should deploy immediately. Yeah, but the bank thinks differently in such cases. So this is why I had CI and CD is always the, you know, the, the question, should you automatically deploy or someone would like to push the button? This is it. But it should be always automated. But I have to say in enterprise it's really rare that you can completely automate it fully deploy several times a day. So this is, for political reasons, doesn't work. But it could work. For instance, right now, we have promoted build with a button. If you push the button, it's production. But someone has to push the button because they like to push the button. So okay, push the button. And the problem is, okay, what is the problem with the frequent deployments? Never Java E, always database. What always breaks the frequent deployment is all the table. This is the simple. This is actually the, you know, the end of relational databases because if you have a huge database and all the table t takes half an hour, game over. Regardless how good am I, know with my wars or whatever, I have to wait because we have one database. Okay? So in, uh, in the annex in Munich, there was one attendee he built with my SQL uh, gaming, uh, whatever, uh, game. He said it would take two weeks to alter a table. So I mean, this is where no SQL, if you get no SQL, then you have to think about the application, then you say, okay, there's no more SQL table, but multiple tables, but you know, in the bank, it's hard. Good point. Any other points? Microservices. So, and um, my point with microservices Java E is, it was always this. So if you were able to identify independent parts, they were independent. And to do this, you had to have deep, deep knowledge. And what is the best practice? What I found is build or, or how it can be only productive. What we already have is agile development, right? So what agile development means, small teams produce something iteratively. How small can be the team? I would say two to five at most developers. Anything else is cannot be productive. So what it means in Java E, two to five developers produce exactly one work. If you have multiple teams, you get multiple works. And these works have to communicate with, with, with each other. And what you get? Microservices. Which protocol you can use, it's different, completely different discussion. But this occurs naturally. What is 
A bad idea is if you have a working application and you tear it apart. If you do it in a project, you have to think about transactions, consistency, basically the CAP theorem, consistency, availability, partition tolerance. And this in a project is crazy. In a product, not so crazy. You have far more time. But is it about microservices? Like you have to stay with one team for one microservice. This worked well, yeah. My microservice is like one team for like 40 microservices. So that's the difference. Yeah, but. I mean, the microservice is more like ideology than the deployment process. Beyond the deployment process. Like more like making, like what you said, transactions. So that in 40 services, you have no one transaction. So you need to understand the logic, the business logic. And then you split it to small steps. Okay. Copy, 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 so, copy. so my. Uh, well, what I did that worked well is like one such a microservice was one essential or key entity. So it would mean in my project would be order or customer or address or invoice. This would be one more. And this worked well because we get such requirements from the business. So it matched perfectly with the business requirements. There's one of one and there was one responsibility, one team, usually even one UI for such a service. And um, many projects would be solved this way, that a small team, a team produces one more and two are done. Perfect. But with this design principle, so there was no waste, just business logic and the, the words were tiny. It's not like, you know, you go and then there are megabytes of, of strange stuff. And then if we got another thing, which was independent, it was naturally a, never call it microservice, I always call it a war. And now we put, and, and, and your philosophy is a bit different, I assume. So my driving force is a business like order, such, you know, something. So I um, don't like to, after I can talk, talk you examples, but it was, um, it is like an object. Object which is important enough to be modeled as, and usually with this object you get use cases, so you can build the API, and this was a microservice. But it was never a half of such an object. So we never would split an order or address or invoice to two microservices. And in Java E, what we did, I always tried to avoid distribution. So execute as much as possible in one process, then you have no transaction problems and the data has to live you know, in the near of this. No two phase commit, forbidden, just one transaction, one process. And the word, the microservice again, was like an entity. Order, shopping cart, something like this. And yours is finer than this? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now this will be interesting how fine it is, it's a method of the, of the thing or whatever. But I, will, I have to say I like it, but this doesn't mean anything. So I'm here to tell you the others like it as well. So and I asked them, what if could we do something, you know? Could to, to move in faster? And this was beyond our scope. We have to use to wait for you know business requirements or we have to wait for production, whatever, but it's not like because of our choice something went wrong. And also one interesting stuff, it is not microservices at all, it is monolithic, but this could be simplified. It's also integral by block that there is uh they controlling robots. Also very interesting architecture with Hazelcast and they processing you know, thirty thousand transactions per second. Which is not a lot, but for one such a thing, it's surprising for, 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 for Java E. Okay, so what I can tell you in Java E space, pro projects in products is completely different because the products you can, you can very deeply optimize uh, and you are, I think, expert in business logic at one point of time. And um, in, in projects, you don't distribute, try to execute as much as possible in one process. Try to keep your team small. One team one output. In my case, it would be one war. And um, if you have to communicate between wars, it cannot be transactional. So I get always the question, no jacks or you could use so fierce transactions, whatever you use, there is, it would, there, if XA is not safe. So, um, so um, then you have to use nuts and uh, you know, deal with duplicates, stuff like this. You also talk about duplicates. How we deal with duplicates in war, for instance, we generate one or a nuns, this is a number which never repeats. We send along with the request, and if the other recognizes the number, it just drops the request, like repeat, and then you can repeat 
all over. So I think the hardest problem in, in microservices, as nobody would agree, is the duplicates issue. This is why the host systems and uh, the mainframes, GMS, was all about deliver once and only once. So by the way, GMS um, is perfect for communication between wars if you have one server. If you have several different servers with different patch levels, even it's hard because GMS is not a st protocol standard, it's a just set of interfaces. So then you have to, to find something else. So what we did in a few projects, we used Hazelcast. Hazelcast is uh, like in-memory distributed grid with events. It worked surprisingly well in those transactions. And um, uh, otherwise we would use something like um, AMQP or some, um, standardized protocol to talk between different applications. But usually in enterprise, so you get one server for everyone. So then you can use GMS for communication. And then there are not duplicates. Why not? Because the GMS, you write to the database first and then re-delivers until it's re -delivered. Any questions? So how much time do I have? Ten. I have no idea. Lots of time? <laughs> <laughs> Security. So this was the security and a lot of questions surprisingly, and probably the answer is uh, very old. So everyone forgot how how to do security. Um, so if I would create here a server. this it is rest. Rest is server. And I would like to create web XML. This is what is needed. This is why I do this. So and then I will get properly here web XML. Much security. So as you can see, you get this choices forever. So what you always got, Jetty, Tomcat. This is from Server One. Is no security. It's the best one. Right. Superfluous in a way. So um, you have form. It's like you have a J uh, something and J user and J password. This is like uh, more or less uh, Java invention. The basic is standard. Basic authentication is username and password. It's like colon separate, base 64 encoded. Client certificate is the best. The problem is hard to install, expensive. <coughs> In digest doesn't matter because it's a half safe security about security. So if I would, for instance, use here basic, I have to implement a rem name. The rem, let's say, of course, this, and then go to the source. You see a um, basic postman, and what it means, the rem is like the database. So what I would have to do is to uh, go to Payara. Actually, I can do this. And open the console, and there should be a security configuration, and they will have to match. So if I go to the server, there is somewhere security perfect realms. So and I will have to create a new realm with the same name. And I can use JDBC. If I use JDBC, I will have to provide you know table name, column name, whatever. So and there is a certificate, FireRAM, LDAP, and Solaris, whatever. And you can get your own realms. It's a standard called Jack, Java Authorization Container Contract. But there are several realms out of the box. So and then what you also have to do, security. Then you have to go here and say the roles and security constraint. And the const con uh, security constraint does the following, gives us URL pattern. Now I can say messages is allow is get for guests and post for admins. And whether you have Java server, server, Java server faces, MPC doesn't matter. Everything is server based. Even GSPs. It's the same security for everyone. So what you then get is you get annotations roles allowed. So in the database here are roles, and the principal belong to a role. 
I don't know when I should stop, but this is your username and password comes to the server. There is a match with the security error. It goes to a database, try to find the principal. The principal belongs to a role. Then you know you are an admin or guest. And then in the code, in the code, not yeah, you can say here yeah, roles allowed, guest. This is a little bit ugly because if it's not allowed, you get security exception. You can map the exception, but it's not very nice. Therefore, you can inject everywhere you want the principle. And the interesting hack is the principle has the username, and the username has to be unique. So what we do, if we need more than this, of course, what you can also do is you can have session context. And not here in server, in EJB, for instance, but I will just <coughs> and say get is user enroll. You can act, get is call enroll. So you can actively uh, ask, am I admin or whatever? But the coolest hack was the principal as a username. So we use the username as a key in our database. So and then you can produce, it looks like this. Uh, Jack uh, principle expose produces and I create just the class here. And then if you go here and say p get username or get name, you have the unique name. And then you can go to your database, populate whatever you like, all the Actions, entitlements, whatever, and make it injectable with this, and do, then you are extremely flexible. So I get a question all the time, you know, do we need framework? If I show this, all the frameworks tend to die because then you separated the authentication from from the um, from the authorization. And in most companies, enterprise companies, uh, it's like the authentication is already set. You use Active Directory, or whatever, you cannot change this, and you cannot enhance it. But the application uh, needs, roles, the authorization part, they are always separated. So this is the separation. You, you got the idea? So and if you create your own interceptor, you can check, you know, whatever you like. So you will get at least two classes and you can implement this. Security frameworks like Shire, Spring Security and stuff like this are more interesting for OAuth. They implement the protocol with the outside world. But I think inside the container this is already solved. So at least this solved all the solution for the project. I wrote an article in Java Magazine, an older one. Java Magazine without the It's a free one in, uh, in English, so you can just look at this. Uh, exaggerate it a bit, but you got the idea? So you use the standard security, you get the principle, the name is unique, you fetch from your database whatever you like, with your principles, actions, whatever, and make it checkable. Perfectly happy or not so happy? Omni faces security. Look at this. Omni faces security. 
OmniFaces, they, they built a security modules plug in just speak and stuff like this. So look at this if you're interested more. Any other questions? To microservices discussion? No? Then we are done. So what I can say, thank you very much. And next time I will call again.